I'm going to start a study of the book of First Corinthians. We shall look at both letters, of course, but we'll start tonight looking at the book of First Corinthians. So in essence, we'll be dealing with the letters of Paul to the Corinthian church. That is what we will be examining, and I'm hopeful to God that all things will go well, that we will be an edified people when all is said and done. And so I welcome you from wherever you are, thanking God that you're able to join us, and I'm believing God that we will have a tremendous time as we study his word together. Of course, as always, I would like to always commence our service with prayer. But tonight to get into the word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we acknowledge that you are king, that you are Lord, and that no powers of earth or even hell can stop your work. We thank you this evening for giving us another opportunity, whereby as the people of God, we can come together to study your word, to indulge ourselves in the healthy banquet that you have placed before us in the contents of your word. Tonight, we commence the study of your word in the book of Corinthians. And Lord, we are prayerful that as we do this diligent study of your word, that our minds will be sharp, they'll be alert, our hearts will be receptive, and that we will be fully prepared to engage in every way possible in the study of your word. Your word tells us iron sharpens iron, and so does a man the countenance of his friend. And so Lord, each of us have our part to play, our contribution to make. And I pray as we study your word, that this will bear itself out in all facts and truths. Take full control now and let the furtherance of tonight's study be to heaven's glory and honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So as I said, we'll be studying the book of uh, the letters of Corinthians that Paul wrote to the church and we'll be trusting God for insight as to how everything will unfold. Now, we do know that the letters of Corinthians were written by the Apostle Paul. It says quite clearly in the opening sentences that Paul is the one who write these letters. We also know sometimes Paul in his letters, he's not the one who actually does the writing. He sometimes have his scribes. But one thing for sure, Paul, is the one whose thoughts are being portrayed in this letter. We also learned as well as from history that while we have two copies of the letters, it is said that Paul wrote at least four letters to the Corinthian church. Scholars also believe that what we have, we have letters two and four. So, our first and second Corinthians, from what scholars are saying, are truly letters two and four. But that aside, that doesn't affect what we are going to do as we study the word of God. What Paul addresses in these letters are quite pertinent to us to understand how we can learn as we endeavor to move forward. And so this evening, I really want us to dig a bit beneath the surface before I get into the actual study of the word, I really want us to get a little background because I think having a little background as to what Corinth was like and what the culture there obtains, you'll understand a little bit better the very content as to what Paul wrote. And so when we look, look into it, we'll recognize a number of things. One of the things that my research revealed was that Corinth was a bustling city of commerce. It was a place where a lot of commercial activity took place. Also, you would realize that Corinth was really a part of Greece. Part of Greece. That is why in the book of Acts, you'll find when Paul left, when he had to leave Athens, he went next to Corinth. That is in Acts chapter 18. 
So Corinth is situated between North and South Greece. And because of its location, this gave Corinth a kind of an opportunity whereby persons, merchants, travelers who want to get from one part of Greece to the other and to conduct their business, they had to pass through Corinth. And so you could understand the buzz that would be taking place there in terms of economical trade. And not only that, in terms of the lifestyle and the culture, because this is a place where you have a lot of people coming together to conduct their business. So it was in a scenario such as this that Paul is now establishing a church as we would know it. And as this becomes the reality, a number of things also born out in this city uh, of Corinth. Corinth also was the place that boasted the temple of Aphrodite. And that, of course, is the goddess of love. That was the goddess of Aphrodite, was the goddess of love that the Greeks worshipped. And of course, the temple was there. Also, it is important to note that this temple had an approximation of a thousand priestesses. A thousand priestesses. And these priestesses really were sacred prostitutes. So it really was something to behold. And these prostitutes, they would be deployed in the city at night, of course, to ply their trade. So you begin to get a picture as to what life was like. Amidst all the economic trade and so on, you can understand the kind of sexual immorality and activity that was playing out. And so this is the context in which Paul is establishing a church as God will have him. This is the situation that existed. Economic trade and lot of activity, but also the lifestyle that came with it. Not only the culture and the lifestyle of those who lived in Corinth, but whenever you have people coming into your port, they also bring their own cultures, their own customs. And so you had a real melting pot of cultures and behaviors. And these behaviors were not often of godly importance or substance. But yet, in the midst of it, this is what Paul was dealing with. We learned as well from the letter, book of Acts, that Paul spent at least a year and a half in Corinth. And when you have a situation like this, the kind of depiction that we have, we realize that Corinth was not an easy city in which to operate, even to proclaim the gospel. In fact, one writer by the name of William Barclay in his commentary series on Paul letters to the Corinthian church, he writes, Corinth became not only a synonym for wealth and luxury, drunkenness and debauchery, but also for filth. In those days, Corinth has become such a deplorable city that when someone say you are living like a Corinthian, it was nothing to smile about. It was really a derogatory term and statement that they are making about you. They are saying that you're either behaving like a drunkard, sexually immoral, and anything that you could speak about that is obscene and filthy. There was even a term that was used to corinthicize. Once they said you're corinthicized, they're really saying that you are living that kind of wild life with all the RGs and so forth that go with it. That is how deplorable and how immoral the city was. But this was the context in which Paul was now starting the church and being one to oversee the work there. There were times, of course, we would know that he would not physically be there, and therefore he would write his letters. But in terms of starting the work, we know he spent at least a year and a half there. 
and he also had assistance in the early stages. And for that, I want to turn your attention to the book of Acts chapter 18, where we look at what Paul was doing there. He met two persons who were from Italy, the Jews, Aquila and Priscilla, his wife. And we understand a little bit more as to what happened as the work was in its infancy as Paul and Aquila and Priscilla engaged in the work of the church. So I'm going to read from verse 1 of Acts chapter 18. And it says, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There, he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. After Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul went, spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From no one I will preach to the Gentiles. Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Speak out. No one will attack you, attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. So as I said, there were these two tent makers like Paul himself, Aquila and Priscilla, who were a couple. And they were also working with him in the initial work of the church there in Corinth. But at the same time, what we are also picking up from these verses, that Paul was in the city and God in a vision is speaking to him as he's starting the work. And God is saying to him, do not be silent, do not be afraid, speak out. And his God is telling him, no one is going to harm you. No one is going to attack you. Remember, Paul had been attacked various places. There have been Athens, Thessalonica, different places Paul had been attacked. So God is reassuring him that now that he's in Corinth, that he won't be attacked. And what I found quite amazing about this is that in the midst of what we are describing Corinth to be, God is saying to Paul, speak up. You never think a country, a city like Corinth, where all this immorality and all this kind of wild living is taking place. It might be a place for the church to stay out and let them basic immorality. But it recognizes, it shows us that in as much as Corinth was a, we want to say, a deplorable city, an immoral city, that God still intended for his church to be established there. And God said to Paul in a vision to encourage him, do not be afraid, do not be silent, do not let anyone shut you up. Preach and proclaim the message in this city. And what this might really do for us, even in here, is to remind us that no matter what the situation might be, what immorality might prevail in our time, 
it is no reason for the church to become quiet. It's no reason for the church to throw her hands, hands up in despair and say, well, maybe it is futile or useless. The church must remain vigilant, must remain vocal. The church must remain visible. And we have seen, even as the work here in Korea is getting underway, it is happening amidst some very challenging situations, very difficult circumstances. And that should give us some kind of inspiration because we live in a culture today where God is not the first thing on many people's mind. And so we now basically have to make sure that we don't allow the prevalence and the prominence of immorality, idolatry, and you name it, to basically drown out the voice of the church. The church must remain steadfast in her commitment and her resolve to serve the living God and to represent him. And as Paul would have had to deal with this kind of a background, even so, he was not deterred. And when he received the instruction from God about not giving up, about not being afraid, he felt re-energized to the point that the Bible tells us he spent a year and a half in that city. And I assure you every time, as the scripture tells us as well as we just read, every Sabbath, Paul was found in the synagogue preaching the gospel. It's only when they began to oppose him and the opposition would have gotten to the point where it would have become physical. Paul said, all right, your blood is on your own head. From now on, I am going to preach to the Gentiles. But interestingly, Paul left the synagogue, but he did not leave the city. In fact, he went next door. They threw him out of the synagogue, as it were, but he went next door to Titius Justus's home, and his house was next door to the synagogue. And I'm pretty sure that that would have also presented a challenge to the officials in the synagogue at the time. But Paul was bent on getting the message out and establishing the work of God in a scenario that was not ideal. In fact, the question might be asked, what is an ideal scenario for which, in which the church can operate? Every situation, every culture, the church should be able to function. Jesus never gave the impression that the church was going to have it easy. Always presented the message in a way to remind his disciples then and us today that it's going to be a real fight. He received persecution and we too shall receive persecution. So all of this basically is happening when Paul is starting the work in Corinth, and in the scenario that we have painted, what we have seen, that Corinth was not an easy place. Think for a moment that when all these priestesses, which are really sacred prostitutes, if this is a term as a sacred prostitute, when they descend in the city, what kind of the probable and immoral thing that would have been taking place? But yet, this was the climate, the culture. And why is this important for us to note? Because you see, no matter which location or which city or village the church is situated in, we got to understand the person who become believers and who enter this church, they are product and they come from the society. So when these people come into the church, you can expect they will come with baggage. They will come with issues, and those issues must be faced. The church cannot say, well, don't come because you are so immoral, because you are this and you are that. The church must be able to address them, must be able to assist them in ways whereby they can 
leave that kind of lifestyle behind. So much so, we realize that the current, as we go through the letters of Paul here, we realize Paul had a lot of issues with the believers. Chapter 6 is one of those books that we're going to look chapter gonna look at and realize that Paul had real issues where they were basically taking each other to court and things of that nature. And Paul had to be very stern with them and say, listen, you don't understand. How on earth can you be taking your brother before the unjust? He said, don't you know that at one stage we are going to be judging the world? So how on earth are we now having an issue with one one another going before the unjust to settle a matter. He says that in itself is an indictment. He said, I'm saying it so as to shame you, to make you realize it is better for you if you have received an injustice, take your injustice from the brother, from the sister, but don't allow yourselves to go before the court. These are things that we will look into more detail. But Paul wanted the church to realize that, yes, you are coming out of this background. This is the context in which you basically have now been saved. But at the same time, Paul was not ignorant that some of those behaviors would come in. Some of the things that obtain in the society at the time will take place. And that is why when you read what Paul says, for example, in chapter 6, as I mentioned, verses 9 and 10, he, he listed a number of things. He said, don't you know that the sexually immoral, the homosexual, the idolaters, the adulterers, he says these are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he made a statement, and such was some of you, but you have been washed. You have been cleansed. And all of this have happened because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But he wanted to remind them that you were part of the darkness. You were part of the culture of Corinth where all these kind of behaviors were normal. And so he had to remind them. And so for us, even as we look at the book of Corinth, the, these two letters that we have from the Apostle Paul, we want to examine them and to learn from them and to see how much we can truly use the lessons presented to us in these letters as a catalyst to help us achieve our own goals even in the 21st century. For us here at the Church of God in Bastia, our theme for this year, which we very well know, is building a culture of growth. And if we are going to grow, not only do we want to grow numerically and spiritually, we want to make sure that we grow even so in our relationship with one another. The way we operate, where we do things, there must be evidence of that growth. And so it is so important for us as we examine Corinthians to realize that this is a church that had a lot of challenges. It was not in a situation that was easy going, but at the same time, God intended for his name to be represented. God intended for his people to live holy lives in such a scenario. Because when you are in a situation such as what is described as what took place in Corinth at that time, I assure you it would have really impacted the believers. It is either you are serious about serving God or not. There was no one put in and one put out as sometimes we would cliche it today. You had to be serious for God or you are not. Or else you basically will be fooling yourselves. And so Paul as he is setting out in his letter, and we will see shortly as he begins by greeting them and dealing right after bat, right after very bat, Paul have issues to deal with. 
Because if you get to the chapter one shot, you realize there's issues with it talking about divisions right away. Some saying I'm for this, I'm for that. So you recognize it was not an easy situation for Paul to deal with. But nothing was ever easy for the church to contend with. And that must also be a reminder to us today. Because I know very often we are looking for the easy way out. We are looking for things to be pretty much on the soft side. But if we are going to be the representative of God in the true sense of that title, then we must know that there are some real battles that we must fight. There are some real challenges that we must come up against. And we must do that with real resolve and deep commitment. And as we see here, Paul was not about to back down. Paul was very committed to what God wanted him to do. And so now he is establishing a work, overseeing a work in a culture as diverse and so perverse as this one. But that was not an excuse for him or uh, even his workers at the time. With him, Aquila and Priscilla, they diligently taught the word of God, preached the word of God, and helped all those who were interested in hearing the gospel. Note as well, while it might not be clearly stated in the letters of Paul, sometimes they are, that not everybody were going to be open and receptive to the gospel. In fact, we learned that from the passage I read in Acts a while ago, referencing Paul's initial work there in Corinth, that there were those who were opposing. There were those who didn't want to hear anything about this Jesus. But that in any way, though Paul would have said on one occasion that I'm going to leave you and go preach to the Gentiles, he would have felt a bit bad that his own people, the Jews, did not accept his message. But it did not mean that he was going to quit in sharing the message. What it did for him was to give him an alternative, a different route that he can take in presenting the gospel. And the same thing must also obtain for us today. That when we meet resistance, if we are proclaiming the gospel to particular individuals or groups, and there is resistance, you just don't give up. You might maybe move on to another group, or another area. But at the same time, resolving that hope and faith that the group that resisted, somehow, that there will be a change. That there will be a turnaround in their lives where they become more receptive. But as for you, the propagator, the minister of the gospel, the message, you don't give up. Because God gives grace and God opens doors as long as we are committed to the process of representing him by being the church. And we are seeing that amid, amongst all the difficult things that Corinth basically boasts, its immorality, it was also wealthy. I talk about commerce and luxury and all these things. Corinth really was a place where it wouldn't have been easy to live a life of godliness. But it wouldn't have been impossible either. Not easy, but not impossible. As long as the mindset was, I want to serve God, I want to live for him, that certainly would have been possible. And so I truly encourage us, as we would go into the work of the Apostle Paul and look at what is detailed in his letters, that we will do so with a frame of mind understanding that the background was not ideal, was not pretty. But at the same time, Paul persevered because he was doing God's work. And that must also mean for us in 2020, 
four, that we too have to persevere, that we too have to stay faithful to the course and to present the gospel in a way that people would receive it and in hope that they will be challenged to live their lives as God will have them. So that basically is what I wanted to just give us a, a brief overview, a background as to what the book of uh, the city of Corinth was like, and therefore in the hope that we'll be able to make a lot more connectivity with some of the issues that Paul would deal with in these letters. And when we do that, we'll be able now to bring them into our own current scenario and see. Because there's an old saying, the more things change, the more they remain the same. There's nothing new under the sun. And while this scenario where Paul had this kind of a background to deal with and to go to church, that scenario happened thousands of years ago. Still today, we are faced with similar situations of challenges within the body of Christ, within the culture or the country or whichever area we find ourselves living and being in existence. And how Paul dealt with it is going to be very, very important to guide us as the Holy Spirit will have us in learning how to deal with it as well ourselves. And so this is where we are going to really now get into the full context of the word of God as we now look to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and endeavor to go forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is what Paul in his writing declares. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Sosthenes. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the, to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this, for he is faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus, our Lord. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other, let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some, of, for some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, 
I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow Christ only. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching <coughs> to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. And it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say, it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God shows things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all. And he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from our sins. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. So now we have Paul initiating conversation with the church at Corinth. And of course, in his usual style, he greeted them in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And of course, to God the Father. And then he began by saying to them in verse 4, he said, I always thank God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. So at this point when Paul is writing this letter, it is evident that he is not there as it was in the beginning. As we would have seen, as mentioned in Acts, and he was there for a year and a half. 
He did work with the church. He established the work there. But now he is no longer there physically. But the church still needed oversight. They still needed guidance in the principles of how to live and represent as true Christians in the world. And so Paul now is writing to them by something that he says in verse 3 might seem very mon mundane in the way he said it. He said, I always thank God for you. And I believe when Paul said, I always thank God for you, he truly meant that even in his daily operations that he lifted up the church. He undergirded the church there and thanked God for the growth that he heard was taking place. So in other words, Paul was also recognizing it is important to celebrate growth, to celebrate people when they make achievements. Of course, we know he really wanted to deal with some issues, but he's not just jumping into the issues and saying, well, I heard this, I heard that. He's mindful to let the body know that you have been growing. I'm thankful for you. I really have you at heart. My desire is to see you mature and develop as God will have you. And so even though he knows that in his letter that there are some issues that he must treat with, Paul is not forgetful to celebrate small steps. He is not forgetful to overlook certain important achievements that would have been made by the body. And this is important for all of us to note as well. That even when we do have situations where we need to maybe deal with an issue, where we might have to be tough, we might have to be firm, but fair, that we understand the tactfulness that we need to employ. How we go about it. Sometimes it's never always about what we do. It's basically is how we do it. We know the situation. We know the slogan. It is not what you do, it's how you do it. So the how is important. And here Paul was commending them because there would have been some positives about the church that Paul was careful and wanted them to know he is aware of it. And this would have been important for the church as well. Because what Paul was also doing is what we will say today is using some form of psychology. Because even if you know that you want to go and address a matter with the believers, instead of just jumping in and start attacking and dealing with the issue, Paul understands what it meant to be tactful. And he was not just being tactful and just speaking things that were not true. These were things that he recognized about the church. He would have heard the disappointing news about the divisions, but he also would have heard about the level of growth that was taking place. And so he was mindful to let them know about that. And that is also important. And we can learn from that, that even today when we have issues to deal with, we have to be careful as to how we approach. Because whenever you have to deal with an issue, especially in the body of Christ, the approach is very important. Because things can go south quite easily. Even though you have good intentions, even though you basically might be in the right in addressing a matter that is totally ungodly. It is just about the way in which the matter is handled. Wisdom must always be exercised. And Paul here, I'm pretty sure he would have been itching to deal with the issue that he would later mention in this very chapter. But it did not prevent him from highlighting the gospel. You know, it is very insightful to learn that as human beings, 
is and as believers, let's not call ourselves, we are human beings too. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we still have that human nature. We have to bear in mind that when we have all that, what we say or how we treat with it, it can basically be a negative when all is said and done, even though we were right in addressing it, is basically the approach that basically, in the end, that will really count and determine in most cases whether we are a success. And so Paul was commending them at earlier about their growth. He says he was thanking God for them and then he commended them. He says that reminded them that they are connected to Christ. He said, I am thank because with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. In other words, I've heard some good things about you. I heard about the giftings that you have. There is no shortage of giftings that you have. Your spiritual gifts, they are on display. And so he is letting them know that there are some positives. And we must do our best to encourage one another. To highlight those positives. Because we can become easily swayed and always want to highlight a negative. Not that we want to condone wrong, but you must be able to find something positive to commend someone. We don't want to be so standoffish as it were and just have an eye to criticize. We also want to have an eye to appraise when it is very much the right thing to do. So Paul was in recognizing this and he was applying it as we have seen. In verse 8, he says, speaking of Christ, he will keep you strong, speaking of Christ. So he's encouraging them now. You're doing good. You are growing, your gifts are there. But in both he said, Christ, he will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day that Jesus Christ returns. So God is going to keep you. So keep up the good work. Keep doing what you're doing. Exercising the spiritual gifts and so on. He's reminding them. And he's saying to them in verse 9, God will do this because God is faithful. Whatever God says, God will do. Our Paul is telling them, God makes your promise and you can really count on God's promise to be maintained. For God to fulfill whatever he says. And he says further on, he says, he has invited you into partnership with his son. What God has done, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he is really letting the church know that I hear I heard some good things and I want them to continue. But as you get to verse 10, this is an issue that he wants to deal with. He wants this issue to be solved. Christ told them that they should live in harmony. They should live as one. And when Paul is telling them this, this is important to know that Jesus Christ himself declares, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. So the, the way we handle each other is a testimony. It is a witness to how the world sees us and how they will respond to us. So he's saying to them, live in harmony with each other. Because he says, as he continues, he said, for some members of Chloe's household, verse 11, have informed me that there are some quarrels among you. And there are some of you who are making the argument, I belong to Paul. I belong to Peter. I belong 
to Apollos or I belong to Jesus only? So Paul had to ask the rhetorical questions. Tell me something. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? He asked these rhetorical questions because he wanted them to stop and think. Consider what you're doing. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? Who is Peter? These are servants of Jesus Christ. And so he said, it does not make sense. For one sector is saying, I belong to Paul. Listen, as human beings, as believers, we might very well have preferences as to certain personality. But that must never be allowed to become an issue for us to say, well, we are divided. I people to hear this person preach, that person minister, that's fine. But it must never become a case where I see myself as a follower or B follower. We must appreciate that while we have diversity, there must always be that harmony, that unity. Paul was different from Peter, from Apollos. Everybody is different. Everybody have their preferences. But Paul was saying, it is not honoring to God when you operate like this. When there is that kind of divisiveness, divisiveness taking place, Paul said that doesn't work. He said there must be a oneness because everybody comes under the one headship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's everybody for all. And that must be kept in mind. And so for us, we have to bear in mind that the division Paul was dealing with here also manifests itself, maybe not in the exact way today. But there, in, even in our time, we have had Christians ridiculing one church over another church. And on what basis? Well, our church is bigger, our church is better, we have better music, better worship, better so and so. But at the same time, we are all under the umbrella, at least we claim, of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm not speaking to those organizations who carry the name or the umbrella, the title of Christians, but their doctrines very much deny the authenticity of the deity of Jesus Christ. And speaking about believers, what you may call in our day, evangelicals. In another place, like in Trinidad, they call themselves full gospel. Whatever terminology you want to use, it must never be used as a tool to separate us. As long as we all subscribe to the Lordship of Christ, having a personal relationship with him and living to please him, we should be able to harmonize. Not only in coming together for functions, but in the way we operate on a daily basis. When we have to interact or interface with one another. Because the world might not say it, but the world, are, world is always looking to see how we treat with each other. And Paul was saying, things were as bad as already in current. The background was not the best. But don't make it any easier for the devil to keep people away from the kingdom. Your job, my job, is to ensure that people are in the kingdom. 
That is our job. Not to them to stay away. Don't give them an excuse, therefore. Give them every reason to want to be a part of the body of Christ. And that is why Paul could be saying to these brethren here, he said, what you are doing is not of God. These are not his words, but that's exactly what he's basically implying. This is not getting us anywhere. You belong to Peter. You belong to Paul. You belong. He said, what is this? It does not make sense. It is not advancing the cause of Christ. All it is doing is dividing us and personal agenda is being put at the forefront. And that is not what is required. If the church is going to move forward, if we are going to grow, we must appreciate that we are going to have differences. Differences are going to always exist in the body of Christ. Even in our small families, our nuclear families, our extended families, differences. But those differences must not translate into division. They must not. And that would have been Paul's message. It's okay, some of you prefer my ministry. It's okay, some of you prefer Apollos' ministry or Peter's ministry. But at the end of the day, it must not cause division. We must all realize that we are all one. We are all serving one purpose. Because in the words, just before he went to that in verse 10, what did he say? I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of what? One mind, united in thought, and purpose. So he's very clear as to what the objective ought to be. And then of course he told them what he heard and rebuked them for their behavior. Challenged them to change and turn it around. And today at the church we must sit up take a look at ourselves. I must be mature enough, bold enough to look at myself and say, all right, this is how I am going to approach this situation. This issue that might have arisen between me and a brother or a sister. I don't want to go and start a different sect here and one there. But we all under one church. No. One lordship. We can confront issues respectfully, deal with them, and move forward. What we don't want is that the differences begin to cause splinters to develop within the body. That is not going to advance the cause of Christ. That is going to give the devil a lot of playground to roam and to do his damage. So Paul here is saying to the church, I am interested in your growth. You have some strength. You have spiritual gifts and all these things. But he says, you have gotten this one wrong. When you start taking sides and start pitting one group against the other. He said, that's not good. That must be dealt with. And so, for this, our first look into the study of Corinthians, Paul is treating with a matter of division. Division does not help the body. Division hurts the body. I have been emphasizing throughout. Differences are permitted. But different divisions are not. Can no two of us going to agree all the time. We are going to differ. And I like to use that cliche 
tongue and teeth, they do clash. They do. Sometimes you will bite your tongue. And like I said, when you do bite your tongue, I don't see you go and make a dental appointment to extract them because you bite your tongue. No. You are just more careful. Tongue and teeth will clash. But you realize they still must live inside your mouth. They still must function within your mouth. Same thing. We will clash sometime, but it does not mean it has to be an explosive collision that leaves a lot of collateral damage. That's what we have to guard against. And that is what division, as Paul was dealing with here, was threatening to do to the body of Christ. So I want us, even as a church of God here, all of us here as a ministry at BCG, that we understand we will have divisions, that we'll have differences rather, but let us not allow those differences to translate into division. If issues arise, we treat with them without allowing them to cause us to go our separate ways. I am going to put a pause on it right there for now. And of course, we're going to continue in this third chapter going forward. And I'm hopeful as we initiate study and discussion on Corinthians that we will do so understanding the original context and at the same time seek to bring it into our own modern scenario and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to make whatever adjustments or changes that will improve us because we truly want to build a culture of growth. We want to be a stronger unit here at BCG. We really want to be. The light and the beacon in this community to help others to come to a knowledge and understanding of who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do for their lives and for their future. So as I pause here tonight, we will continue God's willing. But before I do go, of course, any questions or comments you might want to share from this initial study, of course, you wouldn't have been aware unless you remembered some months ago, I would have indicated that the next study would have been Corinthians. I didn't announce it consistently before I went on that little vacation. So maybe it wasn't in your mind. So coming tonight would have been the first for you to understand that this is the book that we are tackling. But nevertheless, if you have comment or question that you want to raise on what I've shared, what we have looked at thus far, I want to give you an opportunity now before we bring closure to tonight's study. Well, again, I say thanks. Someone want to make a comment? Did the mic, the, the phone is there? Sanctuary? There's a sis brother Ingle there for me. Begin? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I take particular um, degree of seriousness with the warning that you give in relation to dealing with matters straight up. When Sir Paul in the chapter uh, deals directly with certain, certain problems, uh, considering the, the ungodly uh, setting in which these believers were now converted to Christ 
and the culture that existed and how we dealt with that. I, I understand what, what you're saying in relation to when you have issues that you will be mindful to use wisdom in addressing differences of opinion or issues that come up, whether it's a question of immorality or is a question of um, procedure dealing with any issue. Apart from dealing with a matter that is not sinful, right? I, I could understand. Again, you, you want to be cautious uh, a loving person to have difference of opinion and be respectful. And even though you don't agree, you can say you don't agree and use strong language, like to say, I don't agree, or I agree, or I think you're, you're wrong, or so forth, rather than be, be used in derogatory terms. I could understand that. I, on the issue of immorality or sin, therefore, I, I, I don't think you can be too cautious. For, forget the derogatory term. But when you have a, a clear cut issue, as Paul is dealing with, where you have the behavior is contrary to the standard of the word of God, and you're going to deal with that, I think you have to be direct. I honestly believe you have to be direct. When, when, when you have a clear cut issue that you're dealing with as a violation of the standard of God, that God said, listen, I. You know, I don't like this, and there is clear-cut evidence. You're not being judgmental in the sense that you, you, you don't have the facts. If the facts are clear, you, you have to clearly say, in my respect for um, the patient, to an individual, whether they, they, they like the fact that you're direct with them. And there are a number of examples in the Word of God to substantiate that. Paul was direct with these believers. Um, Samuel was direct with Saul when God gave him a command to do certain things. And so if you are going to correct people's behavior and you're going to approach them, you have to use the word of God. And if they take offense to the fact that you are dealing directly with their, with their sinful behavior or, or action or something, you have to be direct because the scripture is what says what sin is and nothing else. And so if, if a believer comes to me and I, I, I did something wrong and it's sinful and they point it out by scripture and I want to take offense, that's for me to, to weigh and to take seriously and to consider my attitude towards the Lord. Because if they're using scripture, what offense can you commit? If you're going to, to um, approach an individual specifically in relation to a, a, a behavior, a comment, a sinful attitude, and somebody say, well, I've prayed about it, and I just want to call your side and talk to you, and you flare up. I, I, I'm the least concerned. I'm not saying I may not be praying for you and so forth, but I, I, I can't think that you, you could take offense in relation to if you're dealing with the matter. That is clearly a violation of the word of God, and you are being approached. I don't know how tactful can you be. And if an individual is clearly shown, as Paul go on to in other passages in other chapters say, am I becoming your enemy because I tell you the truth? You have to deal with error, with truth. You have to deal with sinful behavior, with truth. And if a, if, if a believer is so approached and want to go off the rails, then that, that's, that's, I don't see how tactful could you be. And it is for that female or male to take seriously about your behavior and your response to somebody approach you about something that they clearly can show by scripture. And I think the always right thing to do for the individual is to acknowledge if it's clearly pointed out by the word of God and not go off and, and get with other persons and, and take offense because somebody think. I mean, when, when David was approached, David humbled himself about his sin. And, and I, I, I make it a point that that you can't be too tactful when you're dealing with clear cut error in scripture. You, you have to be direct because if, if, you, if the, the scripture gives you the authority to say 
what what is sin and, and what it is not. And I, I, I understand what you're talking about, about not losing a brother or losing a sister, but you have to be direct. And if you're direct with people and you do it in the spirit of loneliness and you're not going around and making a big fuss about it, but you come to them in a nice, respectful manner and they want to get off the rails and they think, I, I, I don't know how more else you can deal with that. If you if you raise a concern and say, listen, I, I see what the situation is, I see, we understand what happened, and you try to encourage, but in order to encourage, you have to people must we, we have to acknowledge this. If I commit an error, the, the proper thing to do is to be humble about it. And if, if the evidence is clear and, and you approach somebody, the, the proper approach is to say, listen, I heard in response. Because you can you can. You can go flaw, I mean, with flaw, to correct a flaw. You can't, you, can't, you can't come away from scripture to correct an improper behavior. We see it clearly here expressed by Paul, and he deals with the issue of the divisions. He deals with the issue about the carnality about, because they were being divisive. They were being divisive to say, I am of Paul, and I'm of Peter, and I'm of Apollos, they themselves were being divisive. So in order to, to correct their behavior, you have to make them understand that you yourself are divisive in what you're doing. Because Apollos ain't died for you. So if you find a believer is using a kind of behavior, you have to be confronting, confronting him to say, listen, did I die for you? You have to, you have to be direct with him. And, and, and if they're the bias that I don't want to come to church when, when Peter is preaching. Or when when tonight is onward is that I'm going to start that. a study of that because you that is from device. wherever you are. And if the person takes offense that you point that out, because then Zil is used by God, Peter is used by God, and I only want to come to church to hear when Pastor John is speaking. No, and if, and if you hear yes. that kind of comment, you got to confront that. So yes, we no will. Nice way of confronting that. There is no nice way, but to clearly say that by scripture, and in using this first for tonight um, to um, uh, get um, into the word of God. Let us pray. To clearly use the references by Paul, because he's all direct with them. Don't and, be afraid. So I'm saying if you're direct out. with a clear of no one who he uh, outlined in the word of God, and you are direct, and you come to a person with concern and with love and with scripture, and they take offense, I I, I don't see I, I don't see anything for you as a pastor or a fellow believer to be so worried about. You just continue to pray about it and let God deal with the individual because you must confront when you clearly hear, like for instance, I just illustrate and what Paul illustrates, that you're going to be talking after church. And I don't know, when Denzel preaching may come in church. That can't be right. That can't be right. And there is we'll no nice way tonight of, looking of, at of touching on that together. And, 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 and how you deal with that? Say, you, 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 even though you want to deal with the individual. Okay, you know, I, I, I hear you. Straight to tell England, you know, you can't say that. Whether then till preaching or whoever, you, you have to I, confront matters of that kind I, of nature directly and leave, leave. All right, Ingo. Thank you for your uh, input. Um. What I would just say, when I, you, if I you were tactful, tactful does not mean that you're being soft. Tactful just has to do with the approach, basically, you've been very, you've been very considerate. It does not mean that you're going to of compromise. The book of First and whatever the issue would have been, if, it's, if it needs strong rebuke, you're going to give and it. I'm trusting but tactfulness God has to do with that. that All right. I am still aware. I'm going While to start is a serious study matter, of the book of um, infringement of scriptural um, content. I, at the same time, am mindful I'm that you're a believer. And at the same time, when I am direct in dealing with it, as you're mentioning there a lot, being direct, tactfulness really does not mean that you are not going to take into consideration the person's level of maturity or lack thereof. It does not mean that you're going to compromise <coughs> on the scripture, but you are so yes, very we mindful. Will, um, you are doing everything within Thank you for your, your patience. power. 
as a believer to exercise care. As I mentioned here with Paul, Paul lifted up the church, the, the saints. He encouraged them. He complimented them because there were time things about them that were positive. His word and I'm saying if we have of course, as always, I would like to that we must deal with in a direct way service as illustrated with prayer. And some of your examples you gave. We can deal with issues directly, being forthright in bringing some kind of a resolution to the matter. But at the same time, we are mindful that the brother, the sister, whomever, we really want to see them accept because they might never even accept the rebuke. I'm no going to start how, a study of see, the book see, of First Corinthians. We shall look at both Try letters, of course, but we will start tonight, to, tonight to looking at into the, the Word of God. Let us pray. Still might not accept. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we acknowledge that really you are King, that you are Lord, that for us and that believing, no power on earth that we are even thinking. hell can stop you. Away. I have to address this matter. This matter is divisive, and if it's not given the right level of attention and corrective measure, it can really cause more harm by just pushing it aside, as they will say, kicking the can down the road. That's not what you want. You've got to confront. You've got to confront, yes, but at the same time, you are going to endeavor to do it in love. Because I can confront somebody about an issue that I know that you are king, that you are Lord, out of line. To how be very direct with everything you. As we endeavor in other words, as I'm rebuking you for God. the infringement, for the transgression, I would also want to assure you, you have done this. This is not right. I would also want to make sure that I assure you that you have my support. I'm here. I'm not just rebuking you and casting you aside because of what you have done, but I am also giving you the assurance when that tonight onward is that I'm going to start a study to of the book of First Corinthians. And go we shall look at both letters, of that course, but we'll start tonight looking at the, the book of, being of First Corinthians. I so in essence, firm, we'll be dealing with you know, this was not and acceptable, I'm believing God that we will have at, at all levels and you are wrong. But at the same time, when you are getting that as the recipient, you're not going to feel good. You're going to feel bruised, hurt, maybe even considering all kind of thoughts about maybe, maybe not even showing up again or maybe departing from the faith. But I also want to assure you that, listen, this is not the end of the world. I want to assure you that you can bounce back from this. But you have to accept responsibility for whatever the transgression was, and you must have a willingness to cooperate with whatever the corrective measures that must be put in place. You have to cooperate. But at the same time, I am going to be clear. Uh, we are to be clear. Yes, direct, as you mentioned earlier, but at the same time, there must also be that reassurance, reaffirming of our support and of our love. Because it doesn't matter who the person is, what they would have done. As long as we can at least extend that olive branch, as it were, of our support, it is still be, gonna be up to those individuals, that person to accept. But at least on our part, we would have done two things which were required to deal with the matter head on at the same time, to say to the person who have committed the transgression, you are not going to be left out in the cold by yourself. Support systems are here. We're going to help you. But that person or those persons will have to have the willingness to cooperate. If they don't, then there's nothing more we can do but to pray for them and to, in any way we can, solicit some kind of support maybe from afar, but you cannot force them. But you at least let them, they must know that yes, he was harsh, 
Yes, she was very direct in dealing with my situation. But one thing I can look back and say, she said she's going to support me. She, I see moves on her part and his part to really help me. I must see that. That must not be absent. They must not just feel as though that they have been rebuked and that they have been left to the enemy now. They must also know that there is redress. There is a space for them to recover. They must be able to have a resurgence if they are willing. And I emphasize if they are willing. But we've got to be direct, yes, when it is required. But the whole tactfulness that I will speak alluding to has to do with just the approach that we'll have to kind of keep things balanced. And I say that because I know if not maybe currently taking place, I know in times past, churches have been very strong in condemnation of ungodly acts, but the supportive part has been quite lacking. So I really want that to be different with us here at BCG, whatever might be the cause. And when persons get that rebuke, they are to know from the word of God. It's not just my opinion or somebody's opinion, but you show them scripturally, this is not acceptable. This is not Lloyd Johnson just speaking and telling you his opinion. This is the word of God instructing you and helping you see that your behavior, the way you have taken it, is not the right way. And there is need for a change. So at the same time, it's a whole comprehensive package. That Good morning, is family. Going to be How are you? I sincerely hope that you're doing we are well. Dealing with this issue. And as you highlighted, some issues there. That, it means that, that great city making. After they can come to the and help people to stay. Why? Why did you have to be that great city went off into the world. So, what we gotta deal with this. The Bible lets us know that he went into riotous living. He went into living that was coming directly from the world. The world of sin. They began to prodigal son. But it just getting the person back on track if they are so willing. Yes, Sister Paulus, you may step up and make your contribution. Good night. No, to say all that, I would just like to remind us that, Galat that Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 said, Dear brothers, if a Christian is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help him back onto the right path, remembering the, that next time, it might be one of you who is in the wrong. Thank you, Sister Paulette, yes, for that scripture. Galatians 6 1. And of course, Paul there is talking about brethren, of course. The King James says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore. And that's what I was speaking about. Restore. The restoration. Modus operandi must never be lacking. Yes, you're going to treat with the matter. You're going to confront the injustice or the infringement, the transgression, whatever it is. But the restoration agenda must always be present. It is going to be dependent, I know, upon the individual, whether they are willing to cooperate. But that must often be present. So it's not just to be heavy on one end in terms of the condemnation and the rebuke, but the restoration. Because he says, as the scripture you read there just now mentioned, he says, today is that person, tomorrow might be you. you know, he said, you who are spiritual, bestow such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. And the translation you read, they say, it might very well be you next, but what it really means. Today is that individual who is the transgressor. Tomorrow, God knows. It might be you, the individual, who is now in the position of correcting. So you want to make sure that as you're doing that, you are doing so with 
pure motive to really not only stamp out sin and transgression, but you are doing it also with the hope that the brother or the sister will learn the lesson and will be restored. Because if the motive is just to basically condemn, what happens is that whatever we do in this life, and that same passage in Galatians 6 mentions it, whatever a man sows is reap, he reaps. So if I am going to be the one now by correcting and dishing out the rebuke and so on, and my motive is not right, if I don't have restoration as an underlining factor in my action, God forbid something happened where I am on the other side of the equation now. I will be hoping that the persons who are correcting will show mercy and would at least extend restoration. But the thing would be, I didn't when I was on the other end. And whatever we sow, we're going to reap. So the reality is, we have to confront, deal with matters head on as are required. But I'm just imploring us as a church, especially us here as a ministry at BCG, that we recognize and understand that the restoration agenda must never be lagged or left behind. It must be there. It must be right there. Rebuke, condemn, yes. Head on, yes. Direct, yes. But the restoration agenda, that embracive component must still be there. The transgressor must know. I mess up badly by it. I really step out of line. I don't like what I'm feeling now. I don't like the shame or whatever, but wrong is wrong. And if a person is truly honest, when they are confronted about their action, they will say, listen, I was wrong. Maybe at the moment, they might not want to, but if they're really concerned and they are about their relationship with Christ, maybe when all the dust is settled, the smoke is cleared, and they are now have a chance to reflect properly on the situation, they say, listen, I didn't like the way I was feeling. I didn't like how so and so happened, but truth be told, I was in the wrong, and I had to accept that. And at least on this occasion, I was not only rebuked, but I saw efforts being put forward for me to be reconciled. And that's why I mentioned Paul was tactful in the sense that he knew what he had to deal with, what he had to confront, and he didn't just jump into it right away. He was mindful to let them know of the positive things that they were demonstrated. So when they got this rebuke from Paul now, as bitter a pill as it would have been for them to take, but they will be able and honest with themselves to say, listen, at least he praised us as well. He was mindful to praise us for the things that we were doing that were good. And if we can take his praise, we must also be willing to take the rebuke. So there's a, a balancing act that we must have in operation. But the point is taken we have to be mindful and to stamp out any sign of division, anything that will erode the harmony of the body of Christ, it must be dealt with. It must be. And if persons are found to be transgressors, they must be told that this is not right and to be told and shown from scripture why it is not right. And it is now for them to take action, but they must know this is not right, change it. And the support is there to help you move forward. Thank you so much this evening for being a part of our study, for your comments, for your contributions, and for your listening. I know you are there, you are tuned in, you have been listening, or you have been paying attention. It is our hope that you would have learned tonight and that your faith will indeed be nurtured and that growth will be the end result. I'm thankful to those who are here with me 
in the sanctuary, and I'm thankful for all of you who are with us virtually. May God continue to keep his hand upon you, and I pray that you will continue to grow from strength to strength. And remember, we are our brother's keeper. We are to look out for one another, and so let us do our best to ensure that we do a very good job of being our brother's keeper. Of course, as far as announcements go, please remember this coming Saturday, we meet for our, our Saturday morning prayer at 6.30. We meet for an hour to seek the face of the Lord. And Sunday, of course, at 9, we meet for our morning worship. And in the p.m. at 4, we have Christian education hour. So be in prayer for these services and be present where you are required and let us continue to lift up the name of the Lord and to lift up one another in prayer. And so I just want us to continue to pray and to be of support to one another. Just let me at this stage extend my condolences to Sister Juna Jeffers. She informed earlier today that she lost one of her sisters back at home. So we want to remember Sister Juna Jeffers in our prayers, who has lost one of her sisters recently. And we want to remember one another for whatever situations we might be dealing with. Let us continue to pray for one another and to encourage one another, especially in these times where things are so difficult, not just economically, but socially and otherwise, things are difficult. And the more we can encourage and support one another prayerfully is the better. So let us keep these in mind and let us be prayerful one for the other. Let us look to God now as we thank him for a time that we believe have been well spent in the company of each other, but more so in his presence. Lord Jesus, sovereign, great keeper and maker of heaven and earth, we thank you for having granted us this another opportunity to study your word together. We know that, oh God, your word is food, your word is life. Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved. And Lord, we commit ourselves to study because we want to be approved by you, not by man. We want you to say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And so Lord, in keeping with your directive, we study tonight and we will continue to study as you'll give us opportunity. May what we would have studied tonight, Lord God, make a very lasting impression upon our hearts. And whatever we acquire, we require to do differently, that we will have the courage and obedience to do it. I ask you to bless us as we go to our homes. Those of us who are in the sanctuary, who have to travel back home, get back home safely, cover the vehicles in which we will be. And Lord, those in their homes, keep them safe as well. Help all of us enjoy a good night's rest. And if it is your will that we spare, we spare to see tomorrow, we pray that your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, saints. And have a blessed night. Blessed night be with you, God. Blessed night, everybody.